Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome. It is Tuesday, January 28th, 2020, and it's about 32, 33 degrees, cloudy outside in Indiana. Again, looking for a big snowstorm and have not seen one yet, so this is kind of like the winter that wasn't. And not sure where you're at watching us from, if you've had much snow, but uh, here, at least in Indiana, it's been a pretty boring winter. And again, I love snow. I love it when it's like really coming down and you got, you know, 30 mile an hour winds and you get some snow drifts. It's kind of cool, I think. But it's been a winter that uh, has not shown up yet. So hello, Mary Talbot from uh, Oregon, I believe the Portland area. And hello, Nancy with Jacobs. Hello, hello. And welcome to today's show. And uh, uh, Tina Marie Kirkpatrick from Collectation Texas. Hello, hello. I haven't been to Texas for a while. In fact, I'm trying to think last time I was there is probably in July. And that's the, my most traveled state ever, um, especially in the Houston area and San Antonio and a little bit of the Dallas area. So anyways, um, hopefully you're enjoying your Tuesday as we're winding down the last couple days of January before we moved into the month of February. The shortest month of the year and uh, hello Shirley from New Market Virginia and Jennifer Tudor so today I'm talking about a subject that uh, wasn't planned to talk about until I was actually uh, having a conversation with Bob um, yesterday and he we had some questions about how many degrees there are in Freemasons and so forth and uh, after I got, got done doing some research I thought the Lord said you need to do a Facebook live on that again you know, I did it once back in last year, and that was back in um, April, I think it was, something like that, when I was out actually at Dawn uh, Casanova Leniger um, at her home uh, with Paul, her husband, and their kids. And I remember I did the teaching there. We had a lot of people that watched it, a lot of people that didn't know some of the details. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we don't know what we don't know. You know, my grandfather, I didn't know, was in it until he died. And when he died, they had these guys come up in these aprons and stuff. And then I knew that our family ended up leaving at that point in time. And I'm like, who are these guys and why are they wearing aprons? I had no clue. Um, and then it wasn't until later when I actually wrote my book, Restored to Freedom, where I mentioned about some of the things I learned about Freemasons that I had no clue of and some of the dangers and the curses and stuff that were involved in that and how they can affect people and how they can affect children of those involved in that and grandchildren and down the bloodline. So I did some searching and I found a, uh, a, a site called Ministry for Freemasonry that I was reading through that yesterday. And I'm like, this is pretty good, good stuff that will give all of us a good overview of what goes on, you know, with the Freemasons, the dangers, the curses that they state, the oaths that they have to oblige to, and then how it comes down the bloodline, how it can affect us. And then at the end, we're going to go through the prayers to break off the effects of that. And I remember I was talking to a guy the other day, and he said that it's almost impossible for a person that lives in the United States not to be affected by someone that was involved in that. It could be that it's your relative, or it could be someone that maybe you work for that is involved in that. You know, there's, they're in the, you know, we know that uh, when, they, when they started to come in, to the United States, um, like they were in the churches, they were pastors in the pulpit, they were in business leaders that were involved in Freemasons, there were the law enforcement, judges, um, business people and so forth. And so when they infiltrated all that, then it's really almost impossible not to have an effect from this somehow. And so we obviously want to go through breaking off any legal rights that the enemy might have on us that can cause us sickness and disease, because there's a lot of stuff that we are dealing with that are directly related to the oaths of people serving in these organizations. You know, Freemasons are for uh, men, and then for women it's called the Eastern Star, or the Order of Eastern Star. <clears throat> so, I'm just going to read through this and, um, and share, because it's really valuable information. Um, it says, can a Christian be a Freemason? Experience shows us that they can, but the real question, should they? <laughs> Should a Christian be a Freemason? The answer to that is an emphatic no. Absolutely not. Freemasonry is a Luciferian organization. They worship Lucifer, 
as the creator of all things. They call, um, in, their, in their organization, they call this person the great architect of the universe. That is what they make their oaths and stuff uh, for. So they said that the, it's the creator of the Godhead, G-O-D, small G-O-D, H-E-A-D. Lucifer himself is worshipped if you get to the 33rd degree level. There's 33, 33 degrees of Freemasons. And so if you work your way up, it takes time, it takes a lot of money. And essentially those that can get to that level, you know, they're promised all this money and so forth. And those that are in the inner circle tend to be the ones that make the most money. It's those that are on the outside that have to pay all the dues and so forth that don't really make much at all. Uh, but they have the promise of that so that's why they uh, intrigue they have business relationships and they can wear rings and i remember one guy told me that he was a freemason he said all he had to do if he had a speeding ticket is to show the police officer and flash his ring to him and say oh, look at my ring i got my ring um that said freemasons on it and then the person would like write him up with a warning or something and they wouldn't give him a ticket so they would have preferred um favor with the law <clears throat> so, what does their doctrine look like in Freemasons? Well, they have a false Trinitarian deity. The name is AUM, or they may call it AUM, AUM, capital A, capital U, capital M. Its three parts are the three highest Hindu deities in the Hindu religion. You know, Hindu, they have like millions of gods and stuff, but it includes Brahma, which they call the creator. Vishnu, which is the preserver, Shiva or Shiva, S-H-I-V-A, the destroyer. So Om, A-U-M, is the spirit that people call into them when they sit and meditate. So that ain't good, obviously. And then they have a false secret name for God. His name is Jabulon, J-A-H-B-U-L-O-N. Jah, J-A-H, stands for Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, the only true and living God. And then they have Bull, B-U-L, which is Baal, the Babylonian pagan deity. Not good. Uh, as we remember, who worshipped Baal? Jezebel worshipped Baal, and they had Baal prophets, so that's not cool. And then On, so again, Jabulon, On, O-N, it says On or Osiris, the Egyptian pagan deity. So that is their false secret name for God, is Jabulon. They teach that all religions are okay and equal. Well, that's not good right there. In their rituals, they initiate um, kneeling at an altar. And on this altar are all the holy books of religions. They are considered equal with the Bible. They don't want to offend any, yet you cannot mention the name of Jesus or Jesus Christ. Now the ruling power over masonry is Baphomet, B-A-P-H-O-M-E-T. It is the spirit of Antichrist, death and deception. In the 18th degree, the death of Jesus on the cross is called a, quote, dire calamity. And then what do they do? They drink white wine from a human skull with salt and biscuits. They mock and twist the Christian doctrine of atonement through the blood of Jesus. And that ain't cool. Um, there's also a spirit of python. The spirit of python is the spirit that is brought to squeeze spiritual life out of you. The serpent clasp on the apron that they wear is that of the python. Isn't that interesting? In the 31st degree, Egyptian gods and goddess uh, include Anubis, A-N-U-B-I-S, the god of embalming, represented by the head of a jackal. Amun, A-M-U-N, the god of creation, represented by the ram's head. Osiris, O-S-I-R-I-S, -I -I the god of the dead. And Isis, the goddess of fertility, sister of Osiris. They represent a spirit of incest and of phallic worship, male genitals. Pardon. Seen in the obelisks. There are 33 degrees in Freemasonry. This is no coincidence. One degree for each year of Jesus' life. Isn't that interesting? 
If these vows and covenants are broken or revealed outside the realm of Freemasonry, the curses spoken in these degrees will be released upon the lodge member, his family, and his ancestors. So again, if you have anyone that's involved in Freemasons, they're requiring them to make these oaths and these covenants that are very demonic. We're going to go through some of this stuff so you can understand this. And that is why you see we have people that have sicknesses and disease a lot of these times. In fact, when I had my healing rooms that I brought, had people come into um, in Noblesville back, um, when was that? Uh, several years ago. Um, we would take people through these and invariably a lot of people that had back issues, back pain and stuff would come in because of they had some relative that was involved in Freemasons and this Leviathan spirit, which gives us pride, which again, this, the organization itself is, has pride. You know, lots of people that are there, of course, are keeping secrets and doing things that are very prideful. Um, then that's why, why we saw a lot of people that had back pain and neck pain. Um, because of that. The people that were in Freemasons, there's also Scottish Rite, York Rite, or, or other ones. So so anyway, 33 degrees in Freemasonry. This is no coincidence, one degree for each year of Jesus' life. Each degree that a person goes through, so one through 33, has vows, covenants, and curses. If these vows and covenants are broken or revealed outside the realm of Freemasonry, the curses spoken in these degrees will be released upon the lodge member, his family, and his ancestors. So I just want to read that again, how important that this is to understand. Okay, the man is the spiritual covering or priest of the family and home. When he bows before an altar and forms an unscriptural covenant with a pagan deity, an opening or rip forms in this covering. At every stage of initiation into the various levels or degrees of membership in Freemasonry, the candidate is required to take an oath or a vow. So let's go through some of this. First or entered apprentice degree. This is one of them. It says, binding myself under no less a penalty than that of having my throat cut across my tongue torn out by its roots ah, and buried in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark. Should I ever knowingly or willingly violate this, my solemn oath and obligation as an entered apprentice mason? So help me God and keep me steadfast in the due performance of the same. Who would ever do that? And that is the first, you know, entered apprentice degree. Not cool, not good. I sure wouldn't do it. You know, I, again, I never had the opportunity where somebody invited me. My dad never did it, you know, but I know that I used to struggle with back pain. I used to have to go, I had scoliosis, so it was curved, curvature of the spine, whatever. And when I played basketball, I used to have headaches all the time. I went to the chiropractor a lot. I had to sit out my seventh grade basketball year in order to get my spine more straight, and it was not fun. So I believe that that came down as a curse from my grandfather. My grandfather was involved in that. And so, you know, again, we could have it on both sides. You know, we could have grandpa and grandma that were involved in one, you know, the father's side, maybe on our mother's side, we could have someone that was also involved in that and that comes down and affects us. So they speak curses on degree number one as you're an entered apprentice. And they, they target your throat, your tongue, your speech, your eyes, your ears, your emotions, and your mind. This type of oath is repeated at each initiation to the next higher degree. Not cool. Matthew 5, 33 through 37 says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. James 5.12 says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other, other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Someone might say, those oaths don't mean anything. They're just part of a ritual. 
No one really expects those penalties to be carried out. But listen to the word of God. Listen to what Jesus says about our words. Matthew 12, 36 through 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So yeah, that's why it's so important not to say oaths and covenants and take it lightly. Because you think about it, when God created the earth, he spoke it into existence. He spoke all the animals into existence. So by what we speak, we oftentimes see it come to pass. So that's why it's always important to speak life, not death, over yourself. So at the second level, and they call it the fellow craft degree, says the initiate is led to place the penalty of having the left breast torn open, the heart plucked out, and given to the wild beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, if the vows of secrecy are in any ways broken. Degree number two, fellow craft curses are made on the heart, circulatory system, and the chest, vascular system. Ah, oh, not good. So then we become a master mason, which is the third degree. The spoken curse is to, get this, have, quote, the body cut in two, bowels removed and burned to ashes, which are then scattered to the four winds of heaven. So degree number three, the master mason curses are made on the stomach, the gallbladder, reproductive system, um, womb, spleen, digestive system, liver, and kidneys. You know, and I have seen people, um, in fact, I remember one person I prayed for, they uh, were up in uh, Minnesota, they had seen a, a TV show that I had done, and they called afterwards and said, can you pray? You know, the, the, this woman had like fourth stage lung cancer, and when I went to pray for her, I sensed the Lord showing me that she had a relative that was in Freemasons and I asked her if that was true and she said yeah actually my grandfather he's like a 33rd degree Mason and I'm like oh so I started explaining to her the correlation between that and what I had learned and then she said oh my gosh that makes all the sense in the world I'm like what do you mean she said well I had a dream the other night and the dream was Jesus and my grandfather and Jesus told me in the dream the reason that I had cancer was because of my grandfather because of what he had done in the Masons and I'm like Oh my gosh, horrible, horrible. So next, holy, holy royal arch degree and the Knights Templar order. The oath likewise is graphic. The initiate speaks for the penalty of, quote, suffering loss of life by having the skull smitten off and the brains exposed to the scorching rays of the noontide sun, unquote. Further, the initiate speaks of having the head struck off and placed on the highest church spire. Every Masonic degree and order involves similarly graphic death and mutilation penalties. Man, I don't want to sign up for this. <laughs> Deceptions. Number one, they wear a white lambskin apron. It represents their righteousness by their good works. When they die, they are buried with it and believe they will wear it when they stand before the great architect of the universe, which of course is Satan, and will be received because of their good works and self-righteousness. Deception number two, there is a marriage ceremony to masonry where they remove their wedding ring to their spouse. Can you imagine taking your wedding ring off and then saying, I'm gonna be married to the masonry? They pledge their devotion to the lodge. Crazy. Now, that's what they do, though. They remove their wedding ring to their spouse. They put on the ring of masonry. Then they pledge their devotion to the lodge. Um, so the truth is there is a counterfeit for every truth in God's word. Number one, the white apron made from a lambskin competes with Jesus as the Lamb of Calvary. It is through his shed blood, the Lamb of God, and his righteousness only, that we can come before the Heavenly Father, the creator of all things. Truth number two, there is a counterfeit for every truth in God's word. Number two, we are the bride of Christ. We pledge our devotion to and covenant with our spouse and not an organization like Freemasons. 
Uh, beware of the angel of light. Wolves in sheep's clothing. The mixing of truth and error. Freemasonry is cloaked in good works. Mormon history. Many of the rites of the Mormon church involve similar rituals and oaths. The founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, was thrown out of Freemasonry for revealing the secrets of the Lodge by teaching them to, to his followers as divine revelation. I did not know that. Uh, more Mormon history. Mormon pioneer Brigham Young also was expelled from Freemasonry, but the Masonic Square and Compass are on Mormon uh, temple veils and on the breast of the sacred undergarments Mormons wear. Offshoots. There are at least 30 offshoots from Freemasonry. Did not know that. Most of all these lodges and secret societies engage in vows and curses. Many of them are not limited to men. There are a variety of women's, girls, and boys organizations, all very closely associated with Freemasonry. In fact, Demolay, I know, was the boys' version, and then there's Rainbows, I believe that is the girls' version. Rituals. Attacked and mock murder by a gang of men while wearing a hoodwink and beaten, then thrown into a coffin to signify death. Afterwards, they are raised from the dead into the life of masonry. That doesn't sound cool. Other rituals. They take a vow while a sharp pointed spear or compass point is pressed against their naked left breast, and they vow to die by a sharp stabbing pain in their chest if they ever forsake masonry. See, that's why it's so bad to get into this stuff. You know, if you get into it and you stay into it once you realize it's evil, then, oh my gosh, they got you. And then you're on your way, not to heaven, but the other place. So so how do you reverse the effects of Freemasonry? Freemasonry, when you look prophetically at the steps in the Masonic initiation ceremony, what you see is a well-thought-out system designed to capture the spirit, soul, and body of a person, as well as to gain control of their identity, destiny, and value. So Freemasonry, each step requires the person to relinquish part of who they are to Freemasonry. These things will also influence his children and children's children. It is a bloodline issue. That's why it's so important to break off these curses like all the way back to Adam and Eve. Because if you don't, you know, there's invariably everyone sins and their sins can come down multiple generations and affect us. So let's take a look to see exactly what takes place in the initiation ceremony. Okay, the effect on our identity, worth, and destiny. Number one, they exchange clothing. The first step is for the initiate to remove his clothing and put on special clothing for the initiation. Pajamas. Clothing is a prophetic symbol of identity and authority. If you see someone in a police uniform, you know their identity. So the initiate is stripped of his God-given identity of an overcomer clothed in spiritual armor and is given a new identity of passivity, sleep, and confinement. Clothing is linked to authority. Again, if you see someone in a police uniform, you know what they have authority to do. How much authority do you attribute to someone wearing pajamas? Probably not much. Later, they are given other clothing, which identifies them as masons. Okay, number two, their effect on identity, worth, and destiny. They remove all of their valuables. The initiate turns over their money, keys, rings, and other jewelry. These have to do with the person's value, both personal and material. Their God-given intrinsic worth and value as a person is lost. They no longer have value just because they are created by God. They must now earn their personal value by proving how valuable they are to Freemasonry. Aha! This is one of the marks of every false worship system. You must work to prove your worth. Your value is determined by how hard you work to serve in their system. Not good. Okay, number three on the effect of uh, their identity, worth, and destiny. Slipshod slippers and checkerboard. 
The right foot has a slipper put on it designed to make their walk slippery. When the initiation ceremony begins, they are led onto a floor of black and white tiles in a checkerboard pattern. This signifies their path is a mixture of darkness and light. Isn't that interesting? Their foot may slip out from under them at any moment. Their ability to find the path for their life and fulfill their destiny becomes uncertain. This is the opposite of God's word. Our path is to grow brighter and brighter. We are to have hind's feet to leap on high places. The effect on their soul, number four, is this thing called a hoodwink. After the person is properly dressed for the initiation, <clears throat> they are blindfolded or their head is covered with a black hood called a hoodwink. The dictionary definition of hoodwink is to deceive or trick someone. They do not even try to disguise what they are doing. And their effect on the soul, the prophetic significance of the hoodwink is that the intellect, the mind, the eyes, the ears, and mouth all come under the darkness of Freemasonry. The person will not be able to see, hear, think, or speak with spiritual clarity. Things will be obscured to them. You can imagine if you can't see things spiritually, you're going to be all confused and um, believing lies and be led to bad things. Number five, cable toe noose. A noose called a cable toe is placed around the initiate's neck and he's led by someone else through the steps of the initiation. By this prophetic act, they surrender their free will to Freemasonry. They are unable to choose which way they want to go. If they attempt to go a different way, they will be resisted. Number six, dagger or compass point to the exposed left breast. The left breast is exposed and a sharp object is pressed against it. Prophetically, the heart is the seat of a person's emotions. In this step, the heart is exposed and submitted to Freemasonry under the threat of pain or harm. When the emotions are captured by a false worship system, a person may become hard-hearted to protect themselves. They may have inappropriate emotional responses. They may be unable to feel the love of God or the joy of the Lord or the compassion of Jesus. Their emotions are captured. Have you ever met someone that is a Freemason? Have you ever seen a lot of joy and laughter and childlike innocence flow out of them? I have not. I have met several that have been in that for a long time. They seem to be very stoic, not very jovial, not the fruit of the spirit, not really loving, engaged, and happy, and laughing. You don't see that. Well, that might be why, because their emotions are captured. Isn't that interesting? By this point in the initiation, all elements of the soul have been submitted to and captured by Freemasonry. The hoodwink, which goes over their head, captures the mind. The cable toe, which is like leading them around by a noose, is their will is captured and submitted. And the dagger that goes to their left breast is their emotions, which is going towards their heart. Isn't that interesting? So they want to capture the mind, the will, and the emotions. You know, that is uh, their soul. Their soul is being captured by this demonic force called Freemasonry. In addition to capturing the soul, a person's identity, worth, and destiny, destiny have then been captured. They cannot see or hear clearly from God, but even if they could and tried to follow, they would be held back by the cable toe. Um, if they were somehow able to pull against the cable toe, the slipshod slipper might cause their feet to fly out from under them. They would continually feel ill prepared or lacking the authority to do what they sense God is calling them to do. Number seven, the effect on the spirit. With a person prepared in this way, the initiation can begin. The initiate knocks on the door of the Masonic Lodge. Someone from inside asks, who is there? To which the initiate replies, I am a poor blind soul seeking the light of Freemasonry. When the initiate makes this confession, the hoodwink is pulled off and someone says, 
enter and receive the light of Freemasonry. The light of God is exchanged for the light of Freemasonry. This confession submits the spirit of the person to the deception of Freemasonry. A spirit that opposes the Holy Spirit is given preeminence. Discernment is now compromised. The person is captured in false worship and is deceived into believing that it is the worship of the true God, not the great architect of the universe, which is Satan. So that is what Freemasons actually worship is Satan. Not good. Albert Pike, who was one of the early leaders of Freemasons here in the United States, wrote that the purpose of the first degrees is to conceal the higher truths, quote unquote, from initiates. Not until they have gone further are they introduced to worship of Greek, Hindu, Norse, and Egyptian gods. By first committing their spirit to the light of Freemasonry, they have committed to this worship. Number nine, vows and oaths. To complete the initiation, the initiate speaks curses against every part of their body. Who would do that? Crazy. All internal organs and respiratory and reproductive systems, the eyes, ears, tongue, and extremities. Why would you do that? Why would anyone do that? Effects on health. God has pronounced judgments against those who worship the gods of Egypt. The whole issue of Israel in Egypt was worship. The plagues were to show the superiority of the God of Israel over the gods of Egypt. At Passover, the Lord said for them to separate themselves from the gods of Egypt. The sign of this was the blood of the lamb on the lintel and doorposts of the house. It says that when Israel left Egypt, there was not one feeble or sick among them. When they separated themselves from the gods of Egypt, all the diseases of Egypt left them. They stayed with the Egyptians. They didn't go when they ended up leaving, going into the prom or going into the desert. After they crossed the Red Sea, the Lord promised them that if they did not return to worshiping the gods of Egypt, that none of the diseases of Egypt would return to them. Did you know that? I did not know that. That's pretty cool. The converse is also true. So the opposite. If you worship the gods of Egypt, you will get the diseases of Egypt. Egypt had every kind of disease known. One of the reasons they were so advanced in medicine was that they had so many diseases. Oh, I did not know that. In Freemasonry, you are involved in worship of the gods of Egypt. Oh my gosh. So in addition to all the curses you pronounced on yourself, you also get what God has pronounced on those who worship the gods of Egypt. You get all of your curses and you get all the diseases of Egypt. Well, that's not good. So the initiation ceremony brings you into a system of false worship and makes you part of a structure that defines who you are and determines your destiny. Oh my gosh, the Lord just spoke to me. He said, Nelson, remember when a person graduates from being a 33rd degree Mason, they can then become a Shriner. What do Shriners have? Hospitals, don't they? So could it be when people are in Freemasons, Shriners, all that stuff, they're bringing all these curses and sickness and disease on themselves, and now they're capitalizing on it with the Shriner hospitals. I know that they, they retain a huge percentage of whatever money that goes out to the Shriner hospitals, the Shriners do themselves. You know, there's a small percentage that actually goes to the actual care of people that have that. Um, I remember researching that a couple of years ago, but that makes sense, doesn't it? Oh my gosh. So the initiation ceremony into Freemasonry is a covenant ceremony. You pledge your identity, your value, your strength, your loyalty, your body, and your life to something other than God. You cannot honor two conflicting covenants. Freemasonry demands that it be your highest covenantal relationship. The word of God can go into you, into your bone marrow, to produce life in your blood. But if a false covenant is already in place, the word will be hindered. Freemasonry will set its own doctrines above the word of God so that when you read the word, it is filtered by Masonic doctrines. 
By our repenting and renouncing, we have gotten out of the structure of Freemasonry, but we have not gotten the structure out of us. Reclaiming what was abdicated to Freemasonry restores us to personal wholeness. So if the hoodwink, the hood that they put on, gave you an antichrist mindset, then it will conflict with the mind of Christ. You can repent of and renounce the hoodwink, but if you do not reclaim your mind, then it will remain under the influence of the mindset of Freemasonry. I know one individual that he did. He was into Freemasons. He actually worked his way up to the 33rd degree, and I believe he became a Shriner. And it was... He came back to the church and he tried his best to get renounced and, re and repented and so forth, but he still had all this sickness and disease in his body. And he ultimately died. And it was sad, you know, because people tried and tried and tried to help, but he could never truly get freed from everything that he had already said and, and the, all the oaths and so forth. So, isn't that interesting? Many people say that they do not need deliverance from Freemasonry because they have no family history of it. The way Freemasonry is designed, you can be under the influence of it even if there is no family history. Isn't this interesting? Early in the settlement of America, the Masons would build the first building in a new area. The courthouse and any governmental offices would be there. The churches and school would also meet there. Isn't that interesting? Because they were Masons. They were supposedly, when they first started out, they would build things with, you know, rocks and stuff concrete. And so there's oftentimes buildings that have been devoted to, or that were created by the Masons. It could be under a curse. And then you're under the curse if you go into that building or, or whatever. It says Masons occupied as many pulpits as possible. So many pastors were Masons. That ain't good. I see a lot in the Southeast. You know, there's a lot that I've been to around there. In fact, I know the Baptists uh, are a big proponent of Freemasons, and then there's a, there's a list of other denominations that are for Freemasons that uh, are beyond just the Baptist. The civic leaders, the bankers, the businessmen, and the school teachers were Masons. Oh, that's not good. The values of the society reflected Masonic values. In fact, I remember when I was driving all over the United States for the last three and a half years, I would come into these towns and it'd always see like the Freemasons sign, the, um, what's it called? The, uh, compass, um, welcoming you to the town. And then they would have a Freemason building there somewhere, you know, oftentimes on the square. It's like, oh my gosh, that's not good. So not good. So the values of the society reflected Masonic values. The business relationships were determined by Masonic rules. Roles of men and women were set by Masonic standards. So let me give you an example of how Masonic values on women were passed on to the culture. The women's division of Freemasonry is called Eastern Star, or the Order of Eastern Star, and is said to show women how to be godly women. Five characteristics of a godly woman are presented supposedly based on the lives of five women from the Bible. The problem is that the stories of these women have been selectively edited to present the traits desired by the Freemasons. Here are the character traits. Number one, Jephthah's daughter. A woman should be willing to lay down her life so that her husband can keep a foolish vow. You know what? This is so crazy. I just did a teaching on this in the last two weeks, and I never even heard of Jephthah before. And I remember what happened was he wanted to have victory over this army, and he told the Lord, he made a vow for him that, okay, whoever comes out of my house first is going to die. Going to kill them, give them to you. What a stupid vow. He made that. And when he came home, his daughter comes running out of the home, and then she has to die. They gave her, I think, two months to mourn or something like that with her girlfriends before she came back and then died. Who would make that crazy? And who would put that in as a trait of Freemasonry? Well, Freemasons. A woman should be willing to lay down her life so that her husband can keep a foolish vow? That's dumb. Yeah, mm-hmm. So that's Jephthah's daughter. Poor Jephthah's daughter, you know. Anyway, number two, Ruth. 
A woman should work hard, live frugally, save bit by bit, and hopefully become secure in her old age. Number three, Esther signifies a woman should learn to use secret agreements and manipulation to secure her place. That doesn't sound like a good trait. Secret agreements, manipulation. Manipulation's what Jezebel does, control and manipulation. So that's not good. Number four, Martha, a woman can control the actions of God. Your faith causes God to believe that he really can do the impossible. What? I know that we have a lack of faith that can stop God from doing what God wants to do, but I'm pretty sure that God already knows he can do the impossible without any of our faith. <laughs> our faith has to come into alignment with the Lord. So, um, Number five, Electa. Electa, what's Electa? I searched. I didn't see Electa as a Bible person. It's like a Greek mythology person. It says a woman should live a life of service to others and be willing to suffer and die for doing good. So, no, there is no Electa in the Bible. Uh, it says in Eastern Star, there is no kinsman redeemer, no hope of intervention by God, no power of the resurrection. Well, that's not good. Wrong. So, um, in Freemasonry, these things define a godly woman and would be taught from the pulpits. So, any of you guys gone to any churches where they teach this stuff? It's not good. These traits would be reinforced in the home, the school, and the workplace. They would define the place of women in society. Not good. Even if you had no family history of Freemasonry in a society that believed this about women, you lived under a Masonic structure. You see, Freemasonry defined the culture. Your mindset, belief system, and personal identity would be Masonic. This belief system is a structure of false worship. Every false worship system is held in place by the worship of those within the system. Worship is the ultimate goal of all deliverance. Isn't that interesting? Set my people free that they might worship me. Until we have separated from a system of false worship, we are not free to worship God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Until we have separated from this system, we cannot fully submit to God or resist the devil. To fully separate, we have, we have um, to get out of the structure by repenting of and renouncing the steps in the ceremony. Then we need to get the structure out of us by reclaiming what was relinquished. So if you're ready, we can do that right now. I think we all should, because it's really impossible not to have an effect on this. Whether we had someone that was directly in our bloodline or someone that was indirectly or someone that we were taught under, or people that work in these you know, buildings that were created by Freemasons and stuff, they can have effects from them that are not good. So, number one talks about removing of clothing, pajamas. Number two, removal of all valuables. Number three, uh, slipshod slippers and checkerboard. Number four, hoodwink. Five, cable toe, which is that noose. Six, dagger to expose left breast. Seven, seeking the light of Freemasonry. Eight, oaths and vows, which are curses against our internal organs, our body systems, our eyes, ears, tongue, and extremities. So here we go. I'm just going to lead you through these declarations to break this stuff off. And you simply take your authority that Christ gave us and repeat it. So here we go. Number one, I declare that I have repented of all participation in the ceremonies of Freemasonry. Okay, next. I have renounced the spiritual transactions that took place in those ceremonies. Next, I have reclaimed my God-given identity, worth, and destiny. Next, I have reclaimed my soul, my mind, my emotions, and will.
Next, I have reclaimed my physical body. I have reclaimed my spirit. I have broken all covenant agreements with the false religious system of Freemasonry. Okay, I now submit myself, body, soul, and spirit, to the living God, the God of Israel, maker of heaven and earth. I fully enter into covenant with him. I now position myself in active resistance to the devil. According to the word of God, he must run away. I claim my right to every blessing of God. in place of the curses that have been affecting my life. The word of God says that the blessing of God will overtake me. Healing, prosperity, favor, protection, Power, wisdom, and all the blessings of God are now free to come on me and my family. I am unhindered by any connection to false worship. I now freely enter into a new level of worship. Of the true and living God and of Jesus, his only son. With all my heart, soul, mind and strength. I will go to new realms of worship in the spirit. And will join with angels in worshiping you. I will fulfill the destiny for which I was created. Hallelujah. Amen. And there you go. Now I'm going to pray a prayer here at the end um, just to cover everything. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, right now, Lord, for all those curses and all the generations that go back to Adam and Eve, Lord Jesus, of anyone that's ever made these curses and these oaths, Lord, and these covenants, Lord, that we thank you, Father, that they are broken off now and forever, that they will not affect us anymore in Jesus' name. I thank you and declare health and wholeness to be released upon everyone. We declare that the body is healed in Jesus name from the top of our heads to the tip of our toes all sickness all disease go in Jesus name we command again um, our, our skeletal system to be aligned perfectly from the top of our head to the tip of our toes and, and, and the back and the spine be completely healed Lord in Jesus name that all discs pop into the perfect position in Jesus name we command our legs to be the same length and our arms to be the same length to be symmetrical in Jesus name uh, we thank you Heavenly Father God that all of our um, organs are working and functioning perfect in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that our heart, that our lungs, that our mouth, that our neck, um, all components of our body, Lord Jesus, be healed and restored in Jesus' name. Uh, we thank you, Heavenly Father God, 
Um, we also um, ask Jesus to come to heal us in our emotions, in our soul, in Jesus' name. We ask right now all the traumas that we have went through, Lord, in our lives, be broken off in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God. Jesus, just come and speak to us a word. So we just get quiet and hear what Jesus says. Okay, I heard uh, Jesus say, I love you and I'm proud of you, my son. So now we thank you, Heavenly Father God, that any and all demonic spirits that were attached to those toxic emotions be gone and broken off. In Jesus' name, we command you to go to the pit. Every demonic spirit go to the pit now in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father God, for your presence, Lord, for your peace, for your love, for your joy. We release that upon everyone in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, for the truth that we will no longer be blinded, Heavenly Father, by the enemy, but we will be able to see the truth and discern the truth. And when the enemy tries to deceive us and tries to speak to us, we will take authority in Jesus' name and shut the voice of the enemy down in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, as we continue to press in to learn more about who you are and to have more of our identity be of Christ and not of the world. We thank you and trust you, Lord Jesus, that you will lead and guide us and direct us and protect us from the enemy and from deceit and from lies in Jesus' name. We ask you give us wisdom, Lord Jesus, and discernment, Lord. And uh, we thank you, Father God, that we will not be persuaded by anyone from the enemy, that we will be able to see and discern what is truth, what is false, what is a lie in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for protection for our ourselves, our spouses, our marriages, our children, Lord, in Jesus' name. We declare blessings, Lord, over all of us, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, that we will pursue purity and righteousness, holiness, Lord, so that we become more Christ-like every day, and that the things of the world will just, we won't have a desire for anymore. It will not have an effect on us, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Heavenly Father God, for all those that want to receive their prayer language. You just pray for that right now in Jesus' name, that the, the Holy Spirit will, will infill you right now in Jesus' name, and infill you with a, an additional dialect in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, for that. Because when you pray in the Spirit, you know, pray in uh, uh, tongues, you have much more power in the Holy Spirit, and your spirit person becomes stronger against your flesh. And so we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we just release peace that passes all understanding on everyone in Jesus' name, joy unspeakable, full of glory. We thank you, Father God, that we will have the fruit of the Spirit be evident in our lives, love and joy and peace and patience and self-control and kindness and goodness we thank you, Father God, that the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in our lives. Um, we thank you, Father, Galatians 5, 16 through 26, Lord. All those things that are of the flesh, Lord, that will take us to hell. We thank you, Father God, that those will pass away. Those will fall away from us. We will not get into striving, fighting, arguing, dissension, jealousy, envy. All those things from the flesh must go in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father, that we commit our lives to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you for the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, that it is, it is, Lord Jesus, who we are. We thank you, Father God. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, God. We thank you for the testimonies that continue to come out, Lord Jesus, from today's session, Lord, of freedom. We thank you, Father God. And again, if you've been touched and you feel lighter, you feel healed, go ahead and write the comments in. You know, that's what encourages others. You know, it encourages me when I hear testimonies. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. You can't make this up. This is the Lord. The Lord is doing all this. So we thank you, Father God, for that. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We also just pray, Heavenly Father, that people will hear your voice more clearly than ever before so that they can listen and obey and do what you're saying. They will discern if the enemy tries to speak to them and they will shut that voice down. They will not listen to it for a second because if you listen to the enemy, you will not have the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life. You'll have the fruit of the flesh and that is leading you down the road that you don't want to go to. So we thank you, Father God, for just infilling all of us with your Holy Spirit and presence, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, for those that are yawning right now. That is a sign of freedom. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit and the fire from heaven, Lord Jesus. Just fall upon all of us, Lord. Let us feel a real tangible presence of the Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you, God, for that. We thank you for truth, Lord Jesus. Uh, there's so much falseness and deception that's going on out there in the world. We thank you, Father God, for discernment, Lord, at an extremely high level, Lord. We all want to know what the truth is because the truth will set us free. We also pray, Heavenly Father, that we will be honest, Lord. If we are struggling in any areas, Lord, that we will be honest in Jesus' name. 
We thank you, Father God, for honesty, Lord, and purity and righteousness and holiness, Lord. We thank you, God, that we forgive everyone in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God. Hey, received financial breakthrough. Yes, Lord, we just pray for that, God, for all of us that are waiting for you know, a financial breakthrough right now. We declare that, Lord. Angels, we charge you, go forth and speak to those that have the money that you want to bless us with and to bring that forward, Lord Jesus. When we get our lives aligned with the Lord, we will be blessed. We will be protected. So we thank you, Heavenly Father God, for just surprises, Lord, that will happen today, tomorrow, this week, Lord, in Jesus' name, financially, that we will not have to cry for it. We won't have to beg for it for people. We will not have to put guilt trips on people. It will come. It will just come, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for that. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We declare, Heavenly Father, that all enemy attacks will cease in Jesus' name. We pray, Heavenly Father God, for your protective cover, Lord, over us in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God. We just release, Heavenly Father, just your peace, that we completely can trust you for everything. We can trust you for relationship issues. We can trust you for financial issues. We can trust you for the truth, that you will reveal the truth. We thank you, God, for prophetic dreams. Give us dreams, Lord Jesus, that are confirmed by you, Lord. Give us visions, Lord, that are confirmed by you. Allow us, let us see things. Warn us if there's people that we shouldn't be communicating with. Warn us, Lord Jesus, for those that are true, those that are godly, those that are not. We thank you, Father God, that uh, peace, peace is what we really are all after, Lord. Peace that passes all understanding. So we thank you, Heavenly Father God, we just release peace upon everyone in Jesus' name. And, and uh, childlike innocence be restored in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Amen, 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 amen. In fact, I'll say manual. Um, thank you for sharing about the financial breakthrough because there was a person that had that happen when I was down in Texas, we'll say. And um, I didn't pray for it really specifically, but she sensed that there was a poverty spirit that needed to be broken off. She broke off the poverty spirit and then the, the rest of that year of last year, they had a whole bunch, their whole family was getting blessed, 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 blessed. So I thank you and I praise the Lord right now. I thank you, God, for the, the financial blessings, Lord, that you want to bless your people with. You know, when we have a child and the child is no longer treating us horribly and is not off sinning wantonly and is not a prodigal son or daughter, we want to bless them. You know, when they're doing what God wants for them to do, we want to bless our own children. You know, here, do more of what you're doing. You know, help others, you know, lift them up. You don't want to tear people down. That is not Christ. That is not godly. You know, you don't want to lie. You don't want to take on a victim mentality. You want to speak life. You are an overcomer. You want to raise other people up and say, come with me. You want to be a leader. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, God, right now. Just bless everyone, Heavenly Father, more than they can even imagine, more than they can even think about, Lord Jesus. And again, when we have our hearts the same as Christ, why wouldn't he bless us? He wants to. He wants to bless us. And so we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Curse that was thrown at me in 2010. Wow, 10-year curse. That's incredible. So we thank you, Father God. We thank you for purity and righteousness and holiness, Lord Jesus. We want to be a pure and spotless bride. When we come together and we get married, we don't want to have, you know, a bride that is impure, that is ungodly, that is sexually you know, bad. <laughs> we want to be a pure and spotless bride. We want to be godly. So we thank you, Heavenly Father God, for that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are purifying your church right now, Lord, and that if we have anything in us, we want it out of us. In Jesus' name, we are honest, we are open. You know, Jesus, come and speak to us. Let us hear the truth in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God. Amen, and amen, and amen, and amen. Wow, well, that was powerful. I wasn't expecting to do that at the end of uh, of these uh, um, of today's session. So anyway, I, was, I thought it was very educational. I think we've got a lot of stuff that I could feel break off. Um, and I feel so much more joyful and happy and encouraged. And I love the comments that are coming in from people that are yawning, that are getting more freedom. It's way better than that for sure. So... I love normal deliverance where people can hear from the Lord. They end up having more joy, more peace, and they have right thinking. So, so many times we get hurt by stuff in our past, and then it comes and affects us presently with our current relationships. And we hear the voice of the enemy, 
and we end up taking an offense, we get mad, we get angry, we, you know, get triggered, and we go off on somebody and in a crazy way, and then we don't ever take responsibility for that. Well, now we know why. There is un see, unhealed soul wounds from the past. And when you get those healed, you don't get triggered anymore. You can get along with people all the time. You're not going to feel jealous or angry or selfish or all that stuff. You will be Christ-like. And that's a great place to begin, being at peace. Alrighty. Well, I will let you guys go and um, love you. And praise God. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.